Welcome to another episode of the Silver Savage Podcast. This intro is going to be short. I am super excited to have had the opportunity to sit down with Greg Mills, a friend. Uh, I would consider a student because he comes to my classes, but honestly, he's a phenomenal instructor in his own right, a fighter, a warrior, and as we learn through the episode, and I'm sure you guys be intrigued to find out, I personally love finding out how someone can transform from a complete delinquent to a stand-up citizen and somebody that's a leader in this community. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. What's up, everybody? Hi. I'm here with my buddy Greg before we start. Cheers, bud. Thank you for staying. Hmm. Nothing like having some bourbon at noon. Yes. <laughs> I think it's five o'clock in Israel, so we're good. Hey, we already put in on the calorie worker already. Yeah, so to, to Greg's point, uh, you just finished, what, four classes in a row? Yeah. Right? I had to count that. <laughs> uh, so four classes in a row. So catching him when there's very little oxygen and uh, glycogen in his brain. So maybe we get some better answers. Uh, so, Greg, tell our listeners and viewers, I keep forgetting, I checked recently, we actually just get as many views on YouTube as we do uh, downloads on the uh, actual podcast. That's where I usually watch it, yeah. YouTube? Mm -hmm. Funny, the guy that was here last week uh, said the same thing. I was not aware of that. So those of you watching on YouTube, thank you. Uh, with that said, tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you come from. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm Greg Mills. Um, I'm down in Virginia, you know, a couple hours south. Um, I have a, a American Drinker, Krav Maga is my martial arts school. Um, last year, uh, my beautiful wife. I think those are the main main points. Let's take it a step back. Yeah, you're from California. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Born and raised. Born and raised. Yeah. Spent uh, what 33 years there. How old are you? 37. You look like you're 12. <laughs> um, hey, at least I didn't shave. So <laughs> <laughs> I had to shave to look like I'm 12. <laughs> so born and raised in California. What did you do in California? What did I do in California? 33 years. You did 30, something. Uh, well, uh, Oh, that's a lot. Um, I did martial arts most of my life there. Uh, my family's there. My, my parents are still married. They're looking to move out of California, but we've been there our whole life. Um, I like how you mentioned your, your parents are still married because that's an anomaly these days. Yeah, no, it's, I think I mean, it's. My, my parents aren't. I mean, right. My father is dead now, but even when he was alive, they were not married. <laughs> well, I think it's an important thing. Like, um, that was a big thing for my wife and I. So, like, hey, like, I'm. No offense if you can, but. <laughs> Don't take it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going through four. <laughs> yeah. so Honestly, I couldn't four. afford it either. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that, no, my you know, my parents, uh, like anyone else, isn't perfect. They're not perfect, but they they. I feel like they really did their best, and I pushed that to. Uh, I gave that a good test, awesome. <laughs> a solid, a solid test. Cool. But yeah, yeah, they put up with you for thirty some years, so yeah, no, and, it, and I wasn't. It wasn't easy. Like I spent a lot. Of, most of my youth getting into quite a bit of trouble. I uh, got sent away to a, a correctional facility in Utah for, I was supposed to be there for six months, ended up being there Did for you three say years. correctional facility? Yeah, so it was a, uh, it wasn't quite juvenile hall kind of thing, but it was, uh, it, pretty much I took a, I took a deal that in, instead of going to juvenile hall, I'd go to this facility. What'd you and, do um, to deserve that? This time, <laughs> um, it was, uh, I stole my parents' car and got a hit and run, and, uh, yeah. Any injuries, fatalities? No, anything? no, it was great. They were. Uh, it was I, great. I, I, I was waiting for them uh, while they were uh, while they were in a church Bible study, and, and I got bored, so I uh, so I stole their car from the parking lot. And which uh, commandment is that? The chain lot steal? I I returned it. Oh, okay, that was nice. So you, after getting the hit and run, you, you borrowed. Did you didn't yes, steal? Got exactly it. right. And so um, definitely goes against dishonoring your mother and father, but. <laughs> Um, like I said, I was a work in progress, but okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> tried to park because I taught myself how to drive, <laughs> and um, yeah, got in the car, came back uh, later that night. Cops show up the door, and uh, and they're like, "Hey, we were in a hit and run. We no, we weren't. We were in a Bible study." And then they go, flat cop comes out with a flashlight, and the whole side of the car is just mangled. And did uh, your parents not realize that when you returned the car? Yeah, because it was night, and they, they just didn't see the scratches or whatever. Uh, so yeah, no, yeah, that was uh, that was experience. So that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, uh, you know, going in and out through. Uh, so I would love to hear about your experience in Utah, but before we get there, um, 
So I know you now, right? And I've known you for a few years and I know you as a, as a straight lace guy in, in you know, most senses. And you obviously, uh, you view religion very seriously. You know, your, your values are there. What was the 180? What caused you to turn? Um, I'll be honest, martial arts. What, okay. Like one, um, I've always been a Christian. I'm kind of learning what that is. But um, the, when I started teaching, I started one martial arts when I was four. I kind of go up, didn't really stick. But then when I started teaching, I realized that I wanted to be a mentor to other people. And then I needed to pull my head out of my ass. And then that was, that was a long process. That was not a uh, flipping the switch. Um, but <clears throat> years after, that was where it started. Then years after that, um, there was an active shooter at my, local, at my bar that I used to do security for. And uh, I, I tried to, I got detained by police running in. My girlfriend was in there, I lost, uh, one of my students was killed, several of my friends were killed, a police officer was killed responding. Um, that was just a whole mess. Why were you detained running in? Because I was an idiot. <laughs> and, and Well, that's why you were running, but why were you detained? Uh, because they, they didn't know, they, one of I remember is I'm saying, hey, matches the description of the shooter. Mm -hmm. They tackled me, threw me in the back of a police car, uh, which was fun, because I called 911 to get out. <laughs> 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 so um, that was a... Yeah, I had my watch on my, you know, and I, and after a couple hours, I'm listening to everything over the radio, and like, and that one, that's a whole nother, whole nother conversation. But uh, once I realized, was found that okay, this after a couple out, a few hours that day, this is detained, the shooter had been killed, or he killed himself, but um, and people were out. Uh, I, <laughs> I was able to call my, I was calling my uh, family on my phone because my phone was in the front, and they didn't take my watch, and uh, let them know I was okay and. Two of my friends, I called and I'm like, where are you? I'm in the back of the police car. You idiot, did you try to, <laughs> right? And which is, I will say, it was a stupid thing to do. But um, I had people that I cared about and went in and- So let me ask so you this. Then, so I'm stopping you on purpose, but you say it's a stupid thing to do, but knowing our culture, right? Our mindset, I don't think any, either one of us for sure, but I would argue most of our listeners as well, we would have done the same thing. Yeah, I don't. Uh, and, and listen, as a police yeah. officer and as a medic, and I understand the value of keeping people out and letting us manage the scene, and and, and understand there's a proper response. But I always say, as a, as a parent, as a husband, you know, as a community member, if there's something going on, I'm bypassing whoever I need to bypass and protect those that I care about. Oh yeah, the, the street was blocked off. I curbed my car. Like you just ran in. Like it would. Um, you know, in hi no, hindsight, you know, you look at things like. This thing was being contained. There was still a lot. I, fortunately, I left my gun at home, right? Because, I mean, which, and if I actually gone in, that would have been useful to have. But since I got tackled by the police and stuff, for me, that would be fine on a gun that, you know, in California where, you know, you're not supposed to have those. <laughs> um, did, right? you, did you have a carry permit? No. Or? No. no um, How does it work in California? Very, very poorly. Um, and it depends on just uh, different places. Um, it used to be you had to justify why you needed it for self-defense. Then there's some, some Supreme Court things have happened that changed that around a bit. Now, new some, uh, as best I can remember, now they have it where Newsom's passed it where you can have a you can get a concealed carry, but you can't carry it in these places. And he has brought in the definition of what these places are. Yeah, they're trying to do the same thing in Maryland. They've done the same thing in New York. Yeah, so that was that. But um, okay. yeah, so no, it was. Um, I, I, I would probably do the same thing again, to be honest. Uh, I remember we were at, a, I think Kurt was teaching a, se a, a legal seminar at Crop Camp. And he talk, and they were talking about how um, when you see something get, uh, something going up involved, like, should you get involved and stop it? And everyone's kind of there like, we're all warriors. We're all the mindset, like, tell us that, yeah, we shouldn't do that, but you're going to get involved. Right. And this is a bar without security at for 10 years. Like, I knew this, like, back of my head it was totally a kill house like or just a kill box set up it was just a it was it was bad but um but uh, it had the influence of changing my life as not just from that but in it uh my uh, girlfriend at the time you know she survived uh, her my student was got killed was her best friend um she went like uh, yeah, she's a great person uh but did not handle this that well she wasn't in the best place before it started and so that kind of put me on the task of being a single father for about eight months. She was completely, uh, <laughs> com 
Santa? <laughs> but, so, uh, but yeah, so that's... As a, as a side note, yeah. they euphemize dogs and ball pups. <laughs> so when I hear a noise like that, it's usually a dog falling. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Sorry, for those of you that just heard the noise. Was this, was this not sad enough? <laughs> <laughs> and we just killed a puppy. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, um, that shifted things greatly. Right. right, I was still doing, uh, still in dumb, st dumb things like stealing and doing really, really stupid, stupid things, and uh, and then all of a sudden when I had a when his mom was out of the picture, but then I was t I was pretty much taking care of him by myself and barely making enough money to feed myself and just a whole mess of things going on. Uh, I had to get my priorities straight, and so I tried bringing him to church. Started kind of figuring out how do I do this and that. And, uh, fortunately, uh, he's. Ha he they're happy together now, right? I'm out. I'm I'm out of the picture every once in a while. We have a good relationship. We still communicate a little bit, but um, martial arts kind of that mentorship really launched. Okay, I need to start pulling this together. I need if I'm going to preach something, I should do my best to live it. A lot of hard lessons, and then that was just a real just cataclysmic kind of shift to the way you view the world, right. and uh, which I mean, I don't have to talk to you about that with your with your with your experience, but. Um, yeah, so that's well, that was the big thing that should really shifted that around. Cool, awesome. So before we move forward, I just want to mention we uh, oftentimes when I teach active shooter response, right, and I talk about the differences between Israel and America, right, and I understand I compare apples and oranges, and they're not the same culturally between the mindset of people, the level of experience and training, because everybody serves in the military to whatever extent that is, right. And I make the analogy between the shooting at, um, in Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, the club, the Pulse? Yeah, the Pulse, uh, where we had 52 fatalities, right? I believe over 150 injured, right? The guy shot. If you calculate, he was shooting an AR, let's say 30 round magazines. If each person was hit with one round, right? And you know people got shot with yeah. multiple, right? You talk at least 200 rounds, right? More than that. So I'm like, okay, that's at least seven magazines. So there's six opportunities while he's reloading for someone to do something, right? Oh, absolutely. But nobody did anything. To your mindset about, to your point about the mindset of a warrior, right? And then I make the analogy to a story in Israel where there was a, a coffee house in Tel Aviv had three terrorists coming in with some machine guns, and uh, they were attacked. Sorry, they, they attacked, and they were counterattacked by the people sitting there eating. They had no weapons on them, but they picked up chairs. They picked up whatever. And we ended up with three fatalities, two from shots, one from a heart attack. And the only difference is the response of the population on scene, right? Oh, it right. wasn't a police response, a military response. And so I always try to teach about that, that mindset thing, right? The thing that you did naturally that I would probably do, I wasn't put in that situation. But the idea is that, uh, you know, I, I don't know, you teach that to someone, right? It's hard. It, it is hard. It, it, it also, I mean, it helped me have changed my life through the responsibilities that were thrust on me and the, and that's the, you know the, that was probably other than fam, older family members it was the my biggest uh confrontation with mortality kind of thing right and uh but then also it changed the way i approach my training right like i'm a you know fourth degree in, in american tongue sudo karate right but like that i can kick well Right, but like, Very impressive. Very right? Impressive. but like, a lot of the self defense is missing, which is why I started Krav, you know, years before this. But um, but this made me where why this is where this actually what drew me to you so much was the trauma care, right? Like, uh, actually, uh, my wife's and my uh, one month anniversary of dating was spent doing the T Triple C, right? right. <laughs> right? So, and but like, her being a role player, yeah, her being a role player. So I barely know this woman, right? Who I'm kind of on dates with, and then I didn't know she was gonna be role playing, and and the next thing I know, like I'm laying down, I'm supposed to be laying down fire and looking to go to, to help this person, and I see this beautiful woman that I'm <laughs> that I'm. And I'm dating, right? And then I go over, you okay? You, ma'am, are you okay? Fuck you! And I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, I don't so, know how to do this. <laughs> for the purpose of the people that are not familiar, Greg's now wife at the time, girlfriend, is a, a theater, you know, individual. I don't know what to call her, right? So she acts yeah. really well. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And fine, she, she'll, she'll freak out. She'll probably hate me saying this, but like, she doesn't like being put on the spot. But she did that thing amazingly. And I'm going there trying to put a tourniquet on her, and she starts wailing on me and all this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> how do I process this? And going through it was it was a wonderful training. It's probably as realistic as it's going to get. Yeah, it was great. And so, but the case in point of 
like being exposed to all this trauma care and stuff, this is where I started adding in with my school, making it much more important. Um, because I, I'm going back to the shooting, I had you know, at least three people who bled out in the bathroom, right? And like, just if someone had a turn, if someone knew how to put that on themselves or on somebody else or an occlusive bandage or all these different kind of things, right? Like how many lives could be saved for something right. simple like that? And that really kind of hit me uh, where, you know, your, your moniker of uh, protect what matters. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, that's what I wanted my school to be. That's what I wanted my family to be centered on. That's what I, so it, there was a really big, complete shift into everything. And um, and as dark as that was, just coming out the other side of it was, uh, uh, it's really kind of all been uphill. It, well, uphill in the positive way, right. not in, it, there's been challenges, but. Yeah, yeah. So that's just life. Yeah. So talk to me about Utah. So you spent <laughs> three years instead of six months. First of all, why three years instead of six months? Um, because I did not do well with authority. So you didn't get out on good behavior? No, no. Yeah. I got out because I graduated high school. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, I actually didn't even really... Did you have visitation? You know, yeah, I got, I got to see my parents every once in a while. Okay. Um, there, there's a point there where early on, they came out about every month. And then as the time went on, <laughs> it became less. But they were always involved. And um, I, one thing I didn't appreciate at the time is that my... My dad's parents, um, my, my grandfather, I consider one of the best people uh, to have, I've ever met. Um, and uh, uh, John Wooden has a quote, you can't live a perfect day until you've done something for someone that can never pay you. Mm -hmm. Most of my life, I thought that was my grandfather that quoted that because he said it so often, then he lived it to a T. And um, so they would, every single week, letters from them, uh, some Bible verses and different things, stuff I, stuff God, I wish that I had kept this stuff right. rather than being the idiot that I was in the inexperience in, in just oh, scripture, I'm gonna throw that out. I would just, I wish I had that. Um, Is it so, still alive? No, there, no, it's not. Um, so yeah, but um, it's been almost 10 years now, but um, yeah, so anyway, uh, the family was involved as much as they could be. And um, I just could not pull my head out. I was smaller. I'm kind of a, I'm a decently big guy now. That was not how I went in there. Um, and between uh, between the other, my peers that were there, right? I was one of the only two people that during that whole three years, I remember, that wasn't there for some sort of drug or more deeper criminal uh, use. And... Uh, so there was a lot of violence there, uh, you know, stabbings. I was, that's the first time I saw, saw blood splatter on a wall. The first time I saw it uh, open the bathroom scene, a good friend of mine who had slit his wrists and his throat and stuff. And just, there, it was a lot of, lot of violence. And then there's also a lot of staff, staff will abuse as well. Solitary confinement, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I wasn't exactly living in behind bars, but there was, you were under lock and key, right? So, right. and uh, yeah, so that was a lot of that was a lot of interesting. Uh, in a weird way, it was almost fun. Looking back on it, it's like, oh man, I miss those. Like, when you get into uh, fights in the uh, cafeteria and detention center and all that stuff, right? You know, it's fun to look back on it because here I am today to look back on it when all that stuff at the moment was terrifying. And, and the uh, reality is that is the gradient essentially that most warriors wish to be trained by, right? How many people go through martial art classes, self-defense classes, tactical classes, but have never been tested? Right. Right? Just going through that three-year experience, you know, to whatever extent that is, even just being in that environment, puts you already in a different level from an understanding the reality of a violent encounter. Different oh, yeah. than most people would, right? Yeah, I mean, we had people that were hospitalized regularly. I don't know that we had one guy come really close to being killed um, uh, right in front of me, I actually, uh, walk in a sock uh, to the back of the skull and I'm right right next to me and so I'm holding down the his assailant and you know just, just, just a, a lot of stuff um, I mean and the and uh, plus side it switched my grades from me ditching school to getting straight A's so, <laughs> so well, when, when you have no options right <laughs> right so you you got out of there what you do after I uh, really probably took advantage of my freedom kind of thing freedom right? so you didn't learn shit not for a long while. <laughs> I, I learned things that take, I wish I was the type of person who learned things the easy way. I'm not, but they get more ingrained. Okay. <laughs> right? So um, 
James, well, the biggest thing I learned is that I was probably on the path to getting into drug use and the, the groups I was hanging out with then. After seeing how much people mess up their lives there, uh, with that, uh, I've, it's never been an appeal for me. I didn't start drinking until I was like 24, 25. So we're making up for a lost time, though. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but, um, so that was good, and you know, I feel... I feel God put me on these uh, through all these trials to be where I'm at now, where I get to use these experiences, connect with parents and uh, and students who have had trouble with their kids, and like you know, like my mom had carried a lot of guilt for a long time, and she, I if I'm, I bet she still does that of of, sending, of getting me having me sent there, and um, all we did was was this this I mean it was during my developmental years all these different things, and. Uh, but they, God, my parents tried everything. Best best heart, best of intentions. They messed up. They, they, they Everyone's going to, right? It's a parenting that's not caught with the manual. Exactly. And we all fuck it up. And so being able to connect with parents at our school and with those who are struggling, I used to, I would I would show up with parents to court cases. I'd show up with parents to, when the police would show up because their kid's doing something. And I, I was able to use all that. I've been able to use that experience to help other people. Cool. And uh, I don't. If I if it weren't for that, it would have been all theoretical, right? Right, theoretical. Something I read in a book, and uh, so I, I I try not to shy away from it at all. Well, I give you credit for that because how many instructors do we know from the martial art world to the tactical world that teach based on theory alone, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is sad. That's sad. I mean, in their defense, I don't may not have had the, ex the opportunity to experience it, right? But uh, so mm -hmm. it gives a lot of value to those instructors that have been through through something and can relate on a different level, right? Yeah. So what brought you to Virginia? Uh, I got a, uh, I was actually Crowd Camp. Okay. <laughs> uh, Crowd Camp, I met a guy uh, who had a couple schools in Virginia and I uh, made a good impression on him. I was just, how'd you get to Crowd Camp? Uh, I, uh, uh, the martial arts convention in Vegas won a comp uh, competition there that came with a free trip to uh, Crowd Camp. So um, what, so the cincher in that whole competition was applying a tourniquet. <laughs> that, that's what slowed everybody down. And I'm like, that's what slows everybody down. I should be faster at this. So just drilling that over and over. And fun story, I had nerve pain going on in my shoulder at the time. So I was uh, taking medication for the nerve pain and also taking medication to help me sleep at night. That morning of the actual competition, I mixed them up. And so I show up, and I'm completely like out of Sleepy. it, out of it. Sleepy. <laughs> my instructor comes up, comes up to me. And he's like, "What's wrong with you? Like, no, you drank too much? Like, no, I took the wrong meds. I'm finding everything I can't stay. Like, you dumbass. I'm like, yeah, but um, <laughs> you're not wrong. Yeah, right. right, right. <laughs> if, the, if the boot fits, right. And uh, yeah, so I went through that. But but the it was the prep work that uh, when we went into that and really drilling it over and over and over. Uh, uh, how to do the course and how to do all that. And it, I talk about this with my students often. It's like, I was freaking drugged and sleepy and all this stuff. I still came out ahead of all because in that state, right, I need to rely on what I had muscle memory I, I had trained in and, uh, and it worked. Right. And uh, 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 Scott Wilcox's wife. Um, Jennifer. Jennifer, right. She didn't recognize that, so she that's why she uh, gave me the... Uh, uh, the Scott Wilcox Award, which Perfect. I didn't realize she was there. So for those that don't know, Craft Camp, uh, you guys should check it out. The International Craft Camp. It's put out by our close friend Ernie and then Kirk. Uh, it's every summer in Northern PA. Uh, they call it Craft Camp, but honestly, it's a lot more than craft. There's firearms, there's jujitsu, there's all kind of different arts, knife fighting. A bunch of some of the best instructors in the world come over to teach uh, blocks of instruction there, and uh, and he tell uh, my close friends he never met Scott. Right. Uh, Scott was one of my, uh, what I would say, literally in a handful of people that I would call brothers, like really the full meaning. Uh, Scott was a very close friend, former, uh, he was a special guy, Superman, right? He's a former Air Force, uh, attached to certain elements within the Special Operations Command for the Air Force. Um, and he, had, he ended up uh, dying uh, prematurely, crashing with his airplane. And uh, the craft camp is held at his old farm. Uh, now his wife Jennifer, a widow Jennifer, lives there uh, with their kids. Uh, wonderful opportunity if you guys have a chance to uh, to come. Greg is there. I'll be there. Uh, I think this year as well. Um, so, so we check it out. 
That is awesome. Yeah. And, and it really, CrowdCap really opened up to a whole new world. I love Ernie's, uh, Ernie's quote uh, stuck with me the first day. Uh, my way's not a way, not the way, it's, it's a way. way. Right. And I just love that because especially growing up from traditional martial arts, Wherever this is the way, way right? right? And, I, and I always bucked against that, you know, authority issues and all that. And, and what we're also growing up street fighting and realizing that like a lot of stuff I'm learning in here has made me better at certain things, but there's no way in hell I'm going to do that when someone's trying to stab me or something right. like, like that. So I didn't have the, that connection, but um, yeah, so that's where I, I made an impression on, uh, on some guy out, on a guy out here in Virginia. And uh, he happened to see that I was looking for a job and I was really looking for I was looking for years to get out of California. Just it was, I don't understand the appeal of California uh, anymore. It's beautiful. Yep. Well, the place parts aren't destroyed are beautiful. Yeah. But, yeah. I think I told you, I took my daughter, who's going to be 17 soon, but for her sweet 16, right? We went, she's into ballet or dancing in general about ballet. So we took her to the San Francisco. I say we, I took her. It was a daddy daughter trip, right? to the San Francisco Ballet, they had a new show for Cinderella and I thought it'd be cool. And then we drove from San Francisco to LA for a couple of days, right? So we, we've spent all five nights, I think, in California. And dude, this is a shit show. Yeah. I mean, I felt almost bad having my daughter there between all the freaking heroin addicts on the street and the beggars and homeless and it's, Horrible. And it didn't and, used to be like that when I grew up. When I grew up, and I'm what, sure the still like parts that. are beautiful. Yeah. But at least that little corridor, San Francisco was a shit show. Los Angeles. What's it now? The boulevard where all the stars are. Uh, Sunset or Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard, yeah. where all the stars on the sidewalk and the Chinese yeah. uh, theater. Anyways, you know, we couldn't walk half a block without somebody coming begging for money or somebody just laying on the middle of the sidewalk just passed out. Yeah. It was absolutely. And where I grew up was uh, Thousand Oaks and. Uh, for years, voted one of the safest countries, uh, top ten safest country or cities in the country, right? And that's where the active shooter happened, right? And now, uh, I, when I go home and visit, I talk to my friends there, and like, like every other day, you're seeing someone getting arrested for something or drug, drug use, or another homeless encampment. So it's it's just encroached itself all out there. But you can, I can get on a whole another conversation. <laughs> about well, that. I would love to get into that conversation with you because I think it would be fun. Um, I do like to get this under a certain amount of time. So, right, yeah. Um, all right, so you met this guy at Craft Camp and he offered you a job yeah, teaching so, in Yeah, so I came up here and I came out to uh, run a school and um, I was given, uh, I'm trying not to throw anyone under the bus, but I was mm -hmm. given uh, warnings by people. You don't want to work for this company, right? And I was like, but it's my ticket out of California. I came out. January, I, my first day here was January 7th, 2020. So that was a very interesting <laughs> first year. And uh, yeah, and so that was, I, what, the, the turnaround was maybe about three months between job offer to, okay, I'm gone. And, was it that quick? I didn't oh, yeah. realize it was that quick. I thought you were there a little bit longer. Yeah, well, no, uh, from, uh, from getting the job offer in California and then coming out to uh, Virginia. Okay. Right, that was about three months. Okay, that, gotcha, that was gotcha, three gotcha, months. Yeah, gotcha. yeah I, was, I was with the other company for a couple of years. Okay. Right. And uh, and with that company, you know, uh, yeah, that was a that was a rocky thing. It was just realizing how corporate it is. And I'm like, I want to teach this. Well, and that's what we'll do. I'm like, but this doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, it, like, there's a lot of leadership issues. There's all, all kinds of things going on. And uh, and so through COVID, teaching uh, teaching out of my van, uh, my out of my Jeep, and on, and parking lots and online. I, I hated teaching online, but I think that made it good because I hated teaching online, but I still wanted to be good. Right. Um, and then uh, and finally things settled down. I was at uh, they had multiple locations, and I was at one of their locations. And after the COVID, several of the students from other ones had been exposed to me, and they're like, "This is completely different. Like this is." This is real Krav, right? Or uh, at least better than what was being offered, right? And then, uh, so they all moved, moved to the school, the, uh, the branch that I was running. And since there was zero supervision, I kind of, oh, I'm just gonna do my thing. I'm gonna do my thing. And so they learned a lot under me and we started introducing them to trauma care. I started, I started a fight class. So they got some sparring and some hands-on. I, I started an advanced class so they get, so our advanced students get some advanced training rather than doing the same lower ring things. And um, 
uh, through a course of uh, things. Uh, long story short, just to call it what it is, I called out someone for sexual harassment that was harassing somebody, and uh, pretty much the directive came from uh, from up high, get rid of me, to like shove it under the things, and and so that happened, and then. Uh, uh, the students who had moved out with me were all like, well, we don't want to go back. And so four of them, <clears throat> well, three of them and then one of their wives uh, said, hey, well, what if we start our own school and put you in charge of it, right, and do your thing? And, uh, and so that's how American Dranger came to be, was that uh, I was just doing my thing, staying by doing, and then had students who came to me seeing the merit yep. of what was going on. And so, yeah. You do the right thing, so things will happen. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about the name. American Dranger. Manger Dranger. 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 So, I can't even spell it, but I'm a foreigner, so that's what it was. Well, Norse. Right. So, yeah, so not even American, right? Uh, well, American, of course, because I'm, I'm proud to be an American, and what the original, like what I view as the original values of what that is. And then uh, Dranger is a Nordic word for a courageous and honorable warrior. So, a lot of people think of uh, dr Vikings and, you know, pillagers, rapists, all these kind of things. and. There was, there was some of that, like in any culture, there's, there's, you can find a history of something in there. But Americans are there, sure, too. Oh, oh absolutely, 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And, and yeah, it's funny. Like, people, well, they did this. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't make it right. Right. right? Um, and so, uh, but the Dranger were, like, that is such an honorable code. They wouldn't fight anyone that wasn't a worthy opponent, right? They didn't want to waste, they, they felt that if they died, fighting someone for an unnoble cause and they wouldn't go to Valhalla, right? And so there was all these things that came into, into what I felt and, uh, encapsulated what a warrior should be. You fight for an honorable reason and you fight courageously to the death and if things don't go your way, you go to Valhalla. So that's where American Drinker came, came from. Interesting. I, I find it interesting that you went the Nordic or the Viking way where coming from traditional martial arts, like I would assume you would go the like the samurai way, right? Because it's very similar right. in that sense, right? It wouldn't find out what you're following. Well, my, uh, my ancestry is Nordic. Well, that makes so, sense. So that, that ties in. So like, like my grandfather, who I talked about, right? I, I didn't even know this until like way well, I was much, old, much older. He's like, we, were watching like the, we were watching some Viking documentaries. I mean, he's like, Gregory, you know that's your ancestors. I'm like, yeah. wait, what? Because earlier, I, I would probably have gone more of the Spartan route right. kind of thing, right? Okay. And, and or even before that, we've gone samurai, but started pulling a little bit away from the traditional. And uh, then when I started kind of really researching and kind of really diving into uh, that history that my grandfather had let me know, like, oh, that's what Spunk was doing. And I was like, there's some really cool stuff. And I love the fact that it's misunderstood. Uh, my, uh, uh, even my, uh, my father-in-law had this thing like, why, why, why is he like Vikings so much? They're all this, 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 and I'm like, that's why I like them because often when we have this warrior mi mindset, right, when you're protecting the Second Amendment, when you're, well, I'm a conservative, right, all those things, they want to blast this as all these negative things, but there's so much more context and layers to all this when you look into it, dive into it, and so and also the idea of the of the sheepdog, right, yeah, the sheepdog looks like the wolf, but it's going, it's, it's what's going to protect the the flock, I, so. I, I love symbology. I love putting it all in there and mixing yeah. it up. So that's what that is. No, I agree. Uh, and I love that. The, I think a lot of it comes to miseducation by the majority, by the general population, right? Uh, so I do agree with you that they're, they're mistake or you knowing why you're doing what you're doing, right? Really comes into play. And I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, so tell, tell us, how did, how did we meet? Why, why are you doing at my school? <laughs> Well, we met uh, we met at Craft Camp, Fucking right? Craft camp. <laughs> right. We met you guys should really go to Craft Camp. I yeah, like <laughs> plug any hurry, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but um, yeah, we met there. We uh, our first class was a uh, was a weapons retention. Uh, remember that? I was it's a whole new thing that I was being exposed to. I was like, this is awesome. Uh, uh, really liked it. We then did. I took one of your uh, one of your pistol courses that that time also, and then as we were. You know, we came back down, and then I, uh, I convinced the guy I used to work with, like, hey, well, we should go up there. We should bring our st our instructors to get serve to do some of this trauma training, and and that kind of started. We kind of just inching our way way through, and uh, then throwing up to more seminars and getting to know our getting our opportunities to talk talk more. 
um, when after I lost my job, uh, which we celebrate every year, by the way. I right? know. Like every year we <laughs> celebrate awesome. me getting fired. It's awesome. I'm like, dude, did you do the right thing? It's worth it, right? Yeah. I think there's a lot of it encapsulates doing the right thing, right? Even there's though, a lot of truth in when one door closes, another door opens, right? 100%. It's usually such a big event door. And it's a uh, and that's another thing. I think this that whole situation was another big thing that changed really further changed my uh, even further down the path of course correcting was that uh, now backtrack. I want to come back to that, but um, so the weekend I got fired, uh, my uh, my wife now uh, girlfriend now wife, she was on a sabbatical to uh, to kind. Of you know, spend some time and pray and to kind of think like, oh, do I want to continue with this think person? Do you feel like the right person? Well, there was a thing. <laughs> she had an opportunity to move to Florida and they, we had talked about me moving down there and opening a school and all these different things. And so as she's coming back, uh, like I call her, hey, I just got fired. She was coming back to break up with me. And so... And so, because she's like, oh man, this guy just got fired and I can't break up with him. That guy- <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pity wedding. I got you tell it. <laughs> I see through that. Yeah, but, it, but, it, but she got to see like, well, this is what he got fired for. This is what, there's, look at the way these students, and she started to see all this stuff and it really kind of, I feel like it got past this, this hesitation that she had that she didn't fully understand, right? And, um, and so, so yeah, so it, it, saved, it saved my marriage. <laughs> You weren't even married yet. I know, right? Right, getting us, getting us preemptively save your marriage. Yeah, but um, and then that's where we ended up uh, going through all this. But uh, you know, the teacher MC and stuff like that. But then uh, that around that time, I reached out to you and because I loved what you would be doing with with your school, and I was like, every time I came out, the mentality, the uh, the the, te- the, the the instruction, I love that. Uh, I love coming out here every, uh, whenever I can for these Sunday classes because I love being able to ask you questions and you're just so open to be able to do it. And so you know and I do, we do things a little bit differently, mm-hmm. but we try to figure out where those, where those intersect and where those are. And, and it's just a, it's a really valued relationship that we had developed over that time. And so coming out to you and asking like, hey, I don't know what to do here. I might need to start my own school or what, whatever. And you gave me a lot of, a, a lot of uh, good advice to the, to think on, and, that, and then I brought out the uh, the owners that are down to have to sit and uh, and hang out with you and and to talk about this, and so it's just kind of built up from there, and it's all just uh, all these dominoes, man, just all kind of bringing it all together. That's awesome. And I always think about our role as leaders to build other leaders, and I find a lot of um, pride in a sense, and and just a sense of accomplishment in seeing you grow and running a super successful school, right, and, and finding your own path, right? And I, I think that's really, if we want to be good human beings, but certainly good leaders, then we have to pass it on to others, right? Because hoarding, hoarding it all to ourselves just really doesn't yeah. serve us any good, right? So I love seeing that. Uh, you're also part of the Silver Savage Coaching yeah. program, right? Yeah, what do you that. think about that, just now? I love it, man. I, I, I love the idea. I feel, I think I'm the youngest person in it. <laughs> Uh, no, no, your wife, your wife is younger, but... Oh, uh, she's younger, yeah. right. <laughs> but, uh, besides, besides, your, besides your wife, I think I'm the youngest person in it, but I'm getting closer, getting a little bit, a little bit. But, uh, I, you know, the, the weekly up, uh, uh, meetings and those check-ins, I enjoy the, the daily uh, morning, the morning briefs. Um, the, uh, the daily check-ins... I need to be better at them. <laughs> you reminded us of this last one, yeah, about the uh, about the leaderboard. And finally, I just said, "Well, let me check this." And I saw where I'm at. And I'm like, "Screw that! I can do better than that." Yep. And so, just having that community to build in, and um, yeah, no, it's that that Silver Savage group has been great. And you know, we'll, we'll listen to this uh, when you first start, when you guys first started, and uh, just you know, something that. Every Monday, I'm like, hey, go on. If there's not one on Monday, I'll text you and be like, yeah. yo, dude, did I miss this? Like, what, 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 what yeah, happened? There was a couple, like two years, we missed a couple. Yeah. And you're like, you can judge me, said thing? No, dude, I just didn't get a chance to record one. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. That keeps me honest and keeps me on, you know. Well, it's that there's value in it, right? And, like, you know, it's hard to point where what there's, there's just so much. Cause you hit so many different topics. And, um, I, and I don't, I don't even know if this was even a mentorship thing, but uh, the probably the most pungent thing that stand out uh, was well, definitely a mentorship thing. But I don't know if it's part of Civil Savage. Uh, the way uh, you talked about 
how you pray over your kids, right? And you uh, give your uh, the blessing to your kids every, every Friday, mm -hmm. right? And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I, was, and I that start, sparked a whole conversation with my wife about like, man, like this is the kind of stuff I want to do. So, well, we should pray for them every day. I'm like, well, but I want this to be different. I'm like, like well, that's a Jewish tradition. Like, well, who cares, right? Like, well, if, I'll be honest. Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism, right? right? Yeah. So you should be taking an all yeah, about Jesus tradition. Wasn't you. Not, <laughs> yeah, Jesus was a Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't the last the last supper was a Passover meal, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, but, I'll be honest. I have my own challenges with organized religion, right? And and living that lifestyle for ten years with my ex-wife, who was an Orthodox Jew, right, and observing everything to the T. I'm like you in the sense that I ask a lot of questions. I'm, I'm more than willing to do everything as long as I get an answer that makes sense, right? right. I just don't like following for the sake of following, right? Yeah, no thank you. Um, <laughs> exactly, but I have to relate on a certain level. And I don't think there's anything that I can relate to more than passing some sort of a blessing or a guardian angel or whatever to my kids, right? That would just make sense in any religion, any culture, you know, just like it's my kids. If I can, if that little blessing keeps them protected for a little bit more, I'll take that chance, right? Well, I think it's even more than just whether or not, you know, whether you want to take it like, oh, blessing some magical protection yeah. you give them. Or is that time that you're building that connection, is that what really gives them the, the blessing? And right, that, that, you know, my, my dad is uh, taking the time to wish this for me, that positive reinforcement thinking, yep. right? And all the, all, the, all these things are fascinating the way they build in together. And so having that in there, like your your kids are not going to forget that. If, you know, they're going to remember that even if they, you know, I veer so. off, right? But at some point, they're, that's going to always be in there when hell is. And that's, I think that's a beautiful thing. I appreciate so, it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, if people want to get in touch with you, if people in Virginia want to join uh, an authentic crop school, somebody that actually... <laughs> I will say this, and, and I'm not saying this lightly because those that know me know I'm very critical of a lot of martial arts schools and even Krav Maga schools. You know, one thing that I give you a lot of credit is you train with a lot of people. You came here and trained by me. You trained by instructors that I brought from Israel, like Gary Fraley. You trained with Ernie and Ann, right? Um, you obviously have your own background with these schools in California where you just tested for your fourth degree. So you, as far as I'm considered the embodiment of Krav Maga being an eclectic and ever-evolving system, you embody that, right? Because how many, how often do we see instructors, like you said, they're like, this is the way, this is the way that it's been done for 200 years and we keep doing that. Krav Maga is supposed to be evolving, right? So I give you a lot of credit. So maybe you and I don't do necessarily everything the same way, mm -hmm. which is fine. From a mindset and philosophy standpoint, you share what I try to do at my school. Uh, yeah. Right. So to that point, if uh, anybody is in the Virginia area, and uh, first of all, where in Virginia are you? We're in uh, Manassas. So Manassas, Virginia, right, Northern Virginia. About forty-five minutes south of TC. Yep. So if anybody's in the area and wants to check out Krav Maga School, where where can they get a hold of you? Um, What's the best way? Adkravmaga.com. You gotta say that as well. A D American Dringer. So adkravmaga.com is our website. Uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, we're on uh, Instagram. So just type in an American Dringer. Um, Which was the one that leads into a porn site? That's Twitter. Oh, so, Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so the American. So don't go on Twitter. Yeah, yeah they maybe go on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the American Dringer Twitter. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want to go there. That was not, has nothing to do with us. I remember that we were having a conversation with our marketing uh, uh, marketing woman, and, and, uh, and I was like, "Oh, I, I think I started a Twitter account." And she's like, "I don't think you started this." And, I, and I'm like, "What do you mean?" I pull, and I'm like, "No, no, I did not." <laughs> so, so unfortunately, yeah. So our our well, our uh, our that's a good point. Our Instagram is official a, uh, ad crowd maga. Okay. But uh, it made honestly, if you guys if you guys go on BK's any of their stuff, yeah. you're gonna see either me at Spartan Defiance or uh, or uh, official AD Krav Maga liking all this stuff because Perfect. I pay attention to it. <laughs> so I'm gonna check them out. Hey, I don't know what all this noise is, so I'm gonna check how many puppies they're killing upstairs. <laughs> but <I'm laughs> certain no, just kidding, dude. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate yeah. you coming to classes on a regular basis. Greg is actually going for instructional training now too, not because necessarily they'll be teaching our system, but just as another layer, right? Another opportunity well, I, to be exposed. You know, I think that kind of to our point about instructors who teach just one way, that often comes from the instructors not going out and learning. 
right? They think that I'm the instructor. I don't need to train. I don't need to do that. And I think that's BS. Right. I, uh, one, I love, I love training. So why would I not keep training and train something different? And then the more times you go through it, certain, go through instructor training. I mean, this is a craft that we got to keep on building at and constantly building at, which is why I love it so much, right? Yeah. Just trying to live like a good life. Like martial arts is never, you never, you're never done. Right. And so I, I really appreciate you having me out. That's right, my pleasure. So cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys all. As always, stay savage. Yeah.